I'm really pleased to welcome Lou Batang from SkyMiser. I'm sure it will be a very interesting presentation. We had some presentation in uh, a few months ago in a, in a conference call that was really exciting. So, yeah, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here to share our open source project, ONC. ONC is Open Your Network. The, the, mm, our goal is the project, the, okay, the goal for the project is try to connect every DOA deep learning accelerator to Onyx file format. And here is our website. If you, if you have internet, we'll come to visit. Okay. Many of you ask us, there are, we already have a lot of AI compiler. Why you guys need to reinvent the wheel? Why you guys need to reinvent a new compiler? Here are some reasons. The biggest reason is uh, traditional compiler like LVM or GCC, they are a kind of a single architecture compiler. What does this mean? That means if you are using uh, ARM GCC, the GCC of course is only produced the ARM instruction set on instructions. But in AI systems, we target on heterogeneous system. That means we have multiple processing units in the same chip. Here are an example of our target heterogeneous system. In this system, you will see it. Okay. We may have, uh, we may have uh, matrix operators that can calculate uh, like GNN or convolution. And sometimes we will have an element-wise operator. This function unit can calculate something like ILU or like softmax. And uh, of course, we will have one DSP or uh, at least uh, over some system they will have, uh, they may have about four NCU. Those, those NCU control the data flow of the system. And in the outside, in the outside of the PCIe, port, PCIe bus, we may have uh, the young, or uh, in some system, we may have uh, Cortex a Cortex-A application processor. So <clears throat> uh, as you see, it, in this system, we have at least two software-defined components. We have the outside application processor and the inside NGU. And in some systems, they will there are element-wise function units also software defined. It. That means you can write some software to control the behavior of the function unit. So in the system, <clears throat> and many of our customers, they are ICZ houses. So they are very good at designing the matrix function unit. They are very good at designing the element-wise uh, element function unit. And they are good at, at connect each component together. But they are facing to the same problem, facing on the same problem. They don't know how to handle software. Because today, software have to control three different kinds of, at least three different kinds of system, three different kinds of processing unit, and each processing unit has its own unique instruction set architecture. Okay, now here is our solution. Uh, in ONC, we think the system is a heterogeneous system. So the first problem is where and when, which component should execute which kind of layer. So take this system, for example. We assume this system has three components. The first is a general processor, CPU, and we have a DSP, and we also have a DOA. Now we are trying to run the convolution layer. And soon we'll find that the DSP is more cost effective than the CPU. So DSC is, bet DSC is better than CPU to calculate the convolution. What will we do? We will prepare the data for the DSP and pull down the convolution to DSP. Okay, the same story happened again. Now we find that DLA is more cost effective than the DSP, so we will do the same optimization. We will try to pull down the convolution to the right place. We call this behavior compulsory spill. The term is borrowed from the catch coherence protocol. Sometimes we will say, okay, we got a compulsory miss. Yes. Okay, then here we borrow the same idea. We say we got a compulsory spill. 
we have to move the convolution to the most cost-effective processing unit. And uh, if you use traditional, com traditional compiler to do this, it's not too difficult. Most compilers already have some basic infrastructures, so you can just revise LVN to support such kind of behavior. Okay, and the other case is like that. Now we have a new two operators, one called X and the other two called Y. And now we find that we find we don't have enough memory to calculate X. How do we do for this case? We will try to pull up the memory need from DLA to the DSP. So we'll just borrow some memory space from the DSP. Then now our DOA has more memory space to calculate the other operators. Then after DOA release enough memories, now we have enough memory space to calculate the same operator. At this time, we will try to store every data from move data from DSP to DOA and recalculate the X again. We call this memory spill. That means we don't have enough memory in, in one processing unit, then we borrow memory from the other processing unit. Okay. And this is the source, <coughs> and this behavior can eliminate a lot of memory consumptions by compilation, in compilation time. And we call it behavior memory spill. Actually, memory spill is what already have in every combined framework. You can just revise memory allocation framework and get the same behavior, get the same function. Okay, let's go further. Now, if we are trying to calculate a new operator, Z, and take, for example, the Z may be a soft, soft max, and then we know most DOA, most ASIC doesn't support doesn't suppose so max. How do we do in this case? Uh, we will try to find the, the processing unit who can support the so max. Now we find DSP can calculate the, the so max, then we will prepare the data for the DSP. And then we will move the operator to the right place. We call this behavior, is the, we call it is it's a, an operator spill occurs. And uh, that is what's new in the compiler theory. Traditional compiler, we just try to move data from one memory system to the other memory system. But today, in the AI system, we have to move the operator from one processing unit to the other processing unit. Units. Let's push us, push our compiler guys we have to almost reinvent all the algorithms to, to make sure our compiler can compare its right. Okay, and the operations bill is one of the most difficult topic in the AI compiler. Yeah. Okay, so another reason why we need to reinvent the compiler, reinvent the wheel is that, um, uh, if you give us a convolution, how many clock cycles the convolution needs not depends on its OP code. It only depends on the input matrix. But if many compiler algorithms like a life range analysis or like memory allocation algorithms, they have a basic assumption. They just assume every instruction has a fixed feature, fixed physical features. Take for example, if you just give a Add, up, add the instruction, then we'll, we will say, okay, let the instruction may take about two class cycles and take about three registers. All, almost all the physical features are fixed, but in AI, every layer has, uh, the physical features of a layer is dependent on its operand, not the OP code. Let it push us need to, need to reinvent almost all everything again. Okay. If we try to reinvent the algorithm, what we can achieve? Here is some experimental result we achieve. And we can, <clears throat> we can eliminate the memory consumption about uh, 3.77 times on average. 
That means if you, before our optimization, if a model, uh, if you need about 100 megabyte to run that model, but after our optimization, you may need just about 200, two, <laughs> to need about 25 megabytes to run it. And for some popular model like uh, YOLO V1, we can save memory consumption about almost 10 times. That means you can save the memory from 100 megabytes to 10 megabytes. That is a significant achievement of our compilation. Yeah. That is one of the biggest reasons why we need to reinvent a new compiler. Yeah. Okay, so ONC is a compiler to support a heterogeneous system. How we support various target device in the same time? Uh, here is our architecture. Mm. We have a very special representation for each person unit, we call it a corporal. The idea is borrowed from LVN. In LVN, there is a string representation called triple. So we just give, uh, in our system, we call it corporal because we can describe not only the hardware and software, we can also describe the tool we are using. So <clears throat> the driver, like the compiler or interpreter, they just give a, a series of corporal. Then we can build a lot of different hardware, target hardware, and we will pack all the backend into one special class we call it platform, and then we will use platform to generate many target-specific passes. So our compiler can uh, do a lot of target-specific algorithms. This is our basic architecture. Okay, I think I don't have too much time, so I will just quickly go through the rest of the slides. Uh, the basic idea of, of our compilation is followed by this is this phases. Um, okay. At the beginning, we will read uh, an Onyx file. And the Onyx file represents a general graph. And the first phase, we will separate that graph into many subgraphs. We call this we call this phase the tensor partition phase. Then F tensor partition will we have many subgraphs. Then we will try to find a topological sort for each subgraph. We call this tensor uh, instruction scheduling. We will find uh, the best order for each subgraph. And uh, when we have the order of each subgraph, we will try to allocate some memory to each subgraph. Then finally, we will try to do co emit. That means we will try to turn, turn Onyx IR to the machine instruction. And uh, here is the definition and is the transformation of the, our intermediate representation. Uh, in compiled terminology, inter we call intermediate representation IR. So at the beginning, the IR is the Onyx format, and we will try to read it and turn it to the Onyx C, C++ API. Then, uh, then every tensor in the Onyx C++ API is just a symbol. So we will, at the first, uh, we will try to do a phase called tensor selection. That means we will try to turn Onyx layer to target specific operators. And the next, we'll try to do memory allocation. That means uh, now, before memory allocation, every tensor is symbol. Then after the memory allocation, we will try to turn symbol to the real virtual address. And uh, now we have an OB call and we have an address. The last phase is try to do a call emit will just generate the machine code for each target devices. Okay. And then there are two so-called platform phase. Platform phase, one is called tensor partition. They will try to uh, separate the whole graph into subgraphs. And the other called operator scheduling. They will, try to they will try to find a sequence for the correct timing. OK. Here are some code. If you are already familiar with LVN, then you will find our interface is very, very similar to LVN, 
but we do it from scratch. So if you want to add a new fast in your hardware, you just need to inherit a, inherit a pass class and override some virtual functions. And uh, uh, so far, ONC is the only one AI compiler who has strong, who can say he has strong path manager. Uh, in ONC, uh, in compile theory, many paths and uh, every path, path may depend on the other path. So uh, there are dependencies between paths. Uh, most the, all the other compilers they don't have, they don't have. Um, instrument to describe the dependence between passes, but in ONC we just leverage the same idea from LVN. So you can just write code like this to describe the pass D may uh, require pass A and pass B. Okay. And uh, one of the most special things in ONC is that we support its ready compiler. Uh, we know TVN they support auto tuning, and uh, uh, the in compile theory we say that is a kind iterative compilation. That means we compile many many times and try to change the parameters in every iteration, and uh, we naturally we support iterative compilation in our path manager, but LVN doesn't support such kind of behavior. Okay. So, for our customers, for uh, for a new DOA, if 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 the DOA already got the LVN support, then uh, in only in ONC we can connect that device directly because we can <clears throat> because we can generate LVN bitcode directly. So if you already have LV. LVN, you have no porting effort on ONC. But some, for some devices, for take for example, uh, our customer, their device only support like convolution and GNN, so they cannot support by LVN. Then they need to write a new ONC backend and to get ONC support. So we can suppose, uh, no matter your device can support LVN then or not, then ONC can support both, both can support both LVN and ASIC. Okay, here is our target device. Um, in the next release, we will have x86 support by LVN, and then we are going to support Cortex, on Cortex N series. Uh, that includes microtensor support, and bad support, and the CNC support. And uh, we are going to support ARC in our system. We have two things. One support, uh, one thing try to support NVDOA, so we'll get NVDOA back in the end of this arc in October. And uh, we already support many DOA like Bitman's Sofan system. Yeah. And uh, uh, here, is, uh, here is some plan about uh, how ONC to support Cortex N. Uh, in Cortex N, there is an open source project called MicroTensor. Uh, MicroTensor is a very interesting project. If you just give him a TensorFlow model, then it will translate the TensorFlow model to C and the C++. And the ONC, we, try, we offer the other path to MicroTensor. So just, you, just, you can use just a Onyx format. Then we will use ONC and MicroTensor will translate it to the C and C++ program and can run on C and C and embed. And now we already finished our linear scan and we, we put some effort to help microtensor team to refactor in their system. So we are going to have a microtensor backend very soon. Uh, ONC project is an open source project, and the project resides in this URL. So if you have internet, welcome to visit our project. And uh, uh, we just released 0.9.2 last week, and uh, we are going to release 0.9.3 uh, on, 
on the 1st of October, here are the roadmap of our system. In the next release, we'll release our open source version of x86 interpreter and the platform register. Platform means we, may, we start to support heterogeneous platform in the open source. And uh, in the next version, we will support x86 JIT and the bundle. Bundle means we will produce an executable file. That file can, that's, if you execute that file, that file just run just like AI model. Yeah. And we're going to have a microtensor backend in the, in the first in the 1.0 version. And then in the next version, in the end of October, we're going to support NVIDIA backend and the full heterogeneous algorithms. Okay, yeah, this is a lesser slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, ONC project, you can visit the project in the open source, and we put all everything on the GitHub. So if you ha have internet, please give us a star. We, and any kind of collaboration are welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Lub. First question. Glad to ask the first question. <laughs> So, um, uh, for for the backend support uh, on Onyx, so uh, I see that um, um, for GPU support, uh, you are leveraging the ALLVM, right? But uh, in mobile space, uh, for example, for uh, Mali, as I know, there is no ALLVM support. Yeah. So, do you have some plan to add a GPU backend, GPU specific backend uh, in Onyx? Okay. <coughs> uh. If I can have a spec of, of Mali in Sargent set, I believe we can just write a Mali backend. <laughs> yeah. But uh, when I was an engineer in MediaTek, we, I never see that. <laughs> I never see Mali spec. We just use it like a library. So, <laughs> spec, please. So, so <laughs> ha have you considered targeting some of the intermediates like Spear V? as a way to, to get access to multiple GPUs? Or is that not a suitable representation? Okay. Uh, uh, about multiple GPU, many people ask us uh, the same question. Um, now, build most of our customers, they, they are trying to do uh, like Severian system or some uh, embedded system. So in their system, they don't have a GPU. So we put this, um, we put GPU support in the letter of our roadmap. At the first, in this year, we'll try to support uh, NCU and uh, the NVDOA first. Yeah. But um, how to support multiple, multiple GPU in the same time is really a big problem. And I still don't know how to do that. Um, so I actually have two questions. The first is uh, for compiling to ASIC, actually a, a very challenging is to arrange the pipeline. So um, do you manage the pipeline yourself or do you leverage a third party to do that? Yeah. Um, the, uh, sorry, the second question is that, um, so you mentioned the heterogeneous runtime, so um, how do you decide which part you run on which device? Is it the rule based or you depend on your some kind of other tuning to yeah. do that? So thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a very good question and there are two questions. Uh, the first question is what? Uh, oh yeah, Papa. <laughs> okay, Papa. Uh, in in compiler, we call it machine descriptor. Yeah, so in our backend, we, have, we don't have official machine descriptor. We just describe the machine by one object we call target info. And there are target info, target memory info, and target application info. And so 
when we request one request the physical features from the backend, we'll put the operator into uh, to traversal or loss info to get uh, the cost of the operator. Yeah, and the thing. Since we have the cost of each operator on each processing unit, then the next problem is easy. We can try to do some heterogeneous algorithm like uh, the KMAC or some cost function to clustering each operator together. And uh, we do the clustering at the first phase, we call tensor partition. Yeah. Let's how we support heterogeneous, yeah. I, when you're doing the, uh, uh, the calculations to determine the time that it will take to migrate an operation to a different uh, IP unit. Yes. When, yeah. you, ha when you support dynamic frequency uh, and voltage scaling or when you have power management and you don't know what the, how do you model those things to be able okay. to know how long it's actually going to take to do that migration? Uh, we didn't think about DBFS in this system now, yeah. And uh, uh, Because we have the communication cost of each person unit and the computation cost of each person unit. So we will, the only thing we need to do is give the platform a cost function. Then, he will try, then we can automatically decide which operator should put on which kind of processing unit. But now we didn't support I mean, DBFS, so Mm. So far, I have to say our team has no idea about how to handle this. So if you have any <laughs> idea, we can work together. Yeah. All right, I think of it. Thank you. So with respect to your cost function, is it on a per operator basis, or do you do it on the collection of operators? Okay. So if you have one that could run on any one of those uh, processing units, you could make a decision to move it next to one in order to avoid the, the transition cost? Yes, there are two dimensions. Uh, one dimension is we have to run the whole model as fast as possible. The other dimension is why we have to eliminate, eliminate the number of data movement. So if a data movement cost is higher than calculate the same operator in the same processor, we will, start, we will try to avoid from move data out. But then sometimes, um, take softmax for example, sometimes when, when operator, operator spill occurs, that means this function unit doesn't support this layer. So the cost becomes infinitely big. let in this case, we will move the operator to the other processing units. Do you, do you take power into consideration for your cost no, function? because for compiler, we don't have precise power model, so, but by, maybe by your help, we can have precise power model, yeah. I believe for now, no compiler has, has power model in it. Right, but I'm thinking more about the, the movement of memory between the two processors, because that's typically a significant cost from a power yes. perspective. Yes, and by, um, the other problem is a kind of NP complete problem, so it is impossible to have an optimal solution. But uh, the same problem is very well known in the EDS in the EDA area. So we just borrow the person loud algorithm from this area. Okay, time's up. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very interesting session. Thank you.